We will not conquer space. We will, we will learn to work there. We will learn to, to use it to our benefit. But you can, how can you conquer something that's so deadly as, as, as the nothingness of space? Well, one of the problems that the Air Force had was how do you get a high altitude pilot safely back down to the Earth? Would it be possible to survive a bailout from the top of the stratosphere? So John Paul Stapp decided that the next step in his research was going to be solving the problem of flat spin. That's what tends to happen to the human body as it comes down. And they knew this because they had been dropping anthropomorphic dummies from high altitude balloons and they'd seen what happened and it was fairly terrifying. So Stapp and Kittinger began to work on the problem of keeping airmen safe on the, the long drop from the edge of outer space back to the surface of the Earth. Kittinger would ascend to above 99% of the atmosphere, where the temperature was below minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and the lack of air pressure would kill an unprotected human in seconds. I think about eight seconds is what uh that it would take at that altitude to uh, perish. Joe Kittinger arrives at the launch site in Tularosa, New Mexico at about two in the morning. It's hot in New Mexico in August, even at two in the morning, and Joe is uh, almost immediately whisked into an air-conditioned van for the suit-up process so that he can put on all the various garments he's going to have to wear to go to the edge of outer space. It took many hours to prepare Joe for such an extreme adventure a time in which the actions of any member of the launch team could have a critical impact on the mission. Shortly after the suit-up process begins, the air conditioner cuts out. There's a backfire on um, a generator motor outside the van and the air conditioner dies. It just so happened that right at that moment, Master Sergeant Gene Fowler, a member of the launch crew, happened to be walking by the van and heard the backfire on the generator. Fowler took the initiative to just go ahead and pop the top off the generator and look inside, and what he saw was that the ground wire had come off the magneto post. So he reached down inside to see if he could reattach the wire. Found that he couldn't reattach the wire, but he could hold the wire to the post, and the air conditioner kicked back in. So what Fowler did that morning was kneel alongside this generator with his arm stuck almost completely inside it with all the moving parts and the heat and the danger of electric shock and held the wire to the magneto post for some two hours while Kittinger and crew completed the dress-up process. And as soon as Kittinger stepped out of the air-conditioned van, Fowler was finally able to, to stand up and go back to his launch duties. And the entire Excelsior crew was really imbued with this can-do spirit. They were all absolutely dedicated to Joe Kittinger and wanted to make sure that nothing went wrong on this flight. Well, it was probably too much to hope for that nothing would go wrong. And as it turned out, at about 30,000 feet on the way up, Kittinger realized that his right pressure glove had failed. And he knew right away what was going to happen. If he kept going up, his hand was going to begin to swell and it was going to be very painful. But he knew that this was probably their last shot for Excelsior. So he made a decision simply not to mention the pressure glove to his ground crew. So he continued to ascend and made it to a height of almost 103,000 feet. It was, it was fascinating to be at, at, this, at the, the doorstep, the threshold of space, and just looking out at, at the world below. He could see 500 miles in all directions. He could see Flagstaff, Arizona. He could see El Paso, Texas. It must have been an extraordinary sight. So now they were ready for the greatest parachute jump of all time. Joe Kittinger grabbed hold of either side of the door, looked out, muttered a little prayer to himself. He said, Lord, take care of me now. Cut off his uh, radio contact with the ground, but just before he did so, happened to mention to them, by the way, my right hand is unpressurized. His hand had swollen to about twice its normal size. It was incredibly painful, but he cut the radio contact, looked out, and took the long, lonely leap into the void. Somewhere around 90,000 feet, he reached his top speed, which was in the vicinity of Mach 1. He was traveling almost at the speed of sound without a vehicle. It was a, an amazing moment that has never come close to being equal. The further I fell, the happier I was because I was getting back down to a friendly earth. He 
fell through the sky, and as he approached Earth's atmosphere, he began to slow down, and at an altitude of about 17,000 feet, exactly on schedule, the main canopy deployed, and Joe was dropped safely toward the New Mexico desert a little faster than he wanted to be coming in because with his right hand essentially useless, he was unable to cut away the instrument kit that was strapped to his back. And so he came in for, the way he puts it, one of his normal crash landings and landed safely in the desert. The landing was, uh, as I said, weighed 330 pounds and I hit the ground pretty hard, but uh, I was just elated that uh, I was still alive. And my ground crew was chasing me in a helicopter and on the ground and they were there immediately and helped me get undressed. And, uh, we were, we were some happy, uh, happy people. Excelsior 3 set altitude and free fall records that have held for nearly five decades. Following Project Excelsior, John Paul Stapp was looking at some numbers one day and saw something very interesting. He realized that more Air Force pilots were dying in automobile crashes on the ground than they were in airborne accidents. He had already worked out the problems of how do you keep high altitude pilots safe in massive deceleration and if they have to leave their vehicle at 100,000 feet. Now he turned his sights to how do we keep people driving in cars safe. His experimentation showed that you could survive a, a very, very severe environment like a crash environment if you were properly restrained. Before that, no one believed that you could survive those kinds of decelerations, so they didn't think there was any reason for seatbelts. Dr. Stapp's efforts eventually brought him to Washington, D.C., where he delivered powerful testimony on the need for civilian passenger restraint systems. The lives that he has saved uh, around the world with lap belts and, and uh, airbags, uh, we'll never know uh, what, what contribution that he made to our society by the work, work that he did. Well, the only thing I'll allow myself to boast about is getting this kind of a research program done for as many years with as many human subjects without a single fatality or a single disabling accident or a single lawsuit. It's really been an incredible career for John Paul Stapp. He later retired to the New Mexico desert just outside of Alamogordo where he did some of his best work and uh, continued to be involved in an advisory role on aeronautical projects, helping to educate the public about some of the amazing things that had happened back in the 1950s and early 60s uh, in the deserts there outside of Alamogordo. <laughs>